Hi everyone, I hope you're all having a very safe and contemplative and productive and lazy and Netflix-filled quarantine. I am Saksham Sharda, I'm the creative director at Outgrow.co and today we are here to record a special episode of Outgrow's Marketer of the Month podcast. And the episode is called Skills You Can Pick Up Online During the COVID-19 Pandemic. I have with me here Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and the head of communications at Property Ledger's Amy Vernon and also the inventor of the hashtag as well as the number one hunter on Angel List's product hunt, Chris Messina. And we are going to directly jump into the rapid fire round because I forgot to press the record button earlier when they were saying hello and hi to the audience. Anyhow, we're going to go to the first question. The top three people you think of when I say coronavirus? Amy. Uh, Fauci, uh, Trump, and Cuomo. Chris? Probably um, Tom Hanks, Fauci, and uh, Trump. On a scale of one, very stable to 10, highly unstable, how would you rate the condition of the world economy? Chris? Um, Is on a scale of 10? I would say... um, I mean, the world economy probably about an eight. Um, I mean, in the, in the U.S., or at least in the Bay Area where I am, things seem relatively stable. Um, but I'm seeing stuff coming out of, like, Venezuela and other parts of the world where things do not look very stable. Amy, on a scale of one to ten? I'd say somewhere around an eight. Okay. Uh, the biggest professional mistake you've made in your life, Amy? I, I uh, insulted an idea of the publishers without knowing it was her idea um, in okay. a... In a group meeting. <laughs> wow, what was, what was the consequence of that? Actually, I, I really suffered. She was she ended up taking it really well, but it still wasn't a very good idea. Uh, wow. <laughs> Chris. Um, I feel like there's been so many. Uh, it's like, where do I begin? But, um, you know, I think <clears throat> the, the lesson that I've learned, um, having done this three times, is to just not go into business with your romantic partner. Okay. The biggest professional mistake I have made is forgetting to press record on this podcast. (laughs) (laughs) It's good. You're making new mistakes. (laughs) All right. First place you'd go to for a vacation once coronavirus ends, Amy. Uh, Well, we, we take a vacation every summer to somewhere with a pool for my son's birthday. So it would be somewhere with a pool. Okay. (laughs) Nice. Um, you know, like I, I always love going to Hawaii. It's always a really good sort of, um, <clears throat> I guess, way of disconnecting, reconnecting with nature. However, I don't know if like, you know, if the pandemic continues and then it pops up again, I can imagine being on like a, an island maybe isn't the ideal spot to be. All right. Uh, the most marketable skill you've picked up over the course of your life, Amy? Asking questions and listening to the answers. Hmm. Chris? That's a good one. Um, I think I think really it's been about figuring out the value of <clears throat> having a deep curiosity, an intentional rejection of, of, of cynicism. Okay. How long does it normally take you to get ready for work in the mornings, Amy? Uh, I can do it in 10, but if I'm really being fair, it would probably be about half an hour. Okay. Chris? It takes me, honestly, like an hour and a half, um, but it's sort of a leisurely, like, get up, take a shower, um, you know, listen to two podcasts and uh, make breakfast and coffee. Worst thing about the coronavirus isolation, Chris? I went on a long hike, actually, yesterday um, in the Redwood National Forest, and there was just, you know, moments where you, you could see people kind of, you know, inching away to the other side of the trail. And, of course, that's necessary, but it just reminds you um, that, you know, everyone basically is like suspect um, in this like massive game of clue. And it just kind of you know, adds a lot of tension. All right, Amy. You know, it's, it's, we have a lot of really great little neighborhood restaurants and stuff. And, and um, uh, I miss being able to grab a pizza when we want to, you know, have a pizza as a family. It's just sort of like those little things. Mm-hmm. Okay. My worst incident was I was sitting, uh, someone was sitting at the bus stop and I went and sat next to them, even though I kept a seat in between and they got up and left. And I was just like, (laughs) that was my worst thing. I was just like, okay, well, they didn't even pick a fight. They just left. And I'm just like, okay. Best thing thing about the isolation, Amy. You know, it's, it's, 
interesting because we're now four of us in this house spending basically 24 seven together and uh, have been really um, not had fights. And so it's realizing how well uh, our little family unit actually gets along. Chris, best thing about the isolation? Uh, I mean, in some ways, there is some beauty in um, the, I guess, repetition of the day, the schedule sort of, you know, being pretty much set. Whereas last year, I was traveling every month, month and a half to a new city, a new country. Mm. How many cups of coffee do you drink per day, Chris? Uh, two. Uh, I've actually gotten down to the point where I'm having like two every three days. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's nice. Do you cover your face with a mask or mask-like material outside, Amy? Yes. Hmm. Uh, I only do when I when I go to grocery stores now. Hmm. All right, on the spot question: What color eyes do you notice the most when you go out, oh, Chris? <laughs> Behind the wow. mask. <laughs> Jeez, that's 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 a really interesting one. I don't know that I notice eyes at all in that way. Um, if I did, I would imagine it's it's going to be lighter eyes. Uh, but but actually, I have no idea. Yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> what, Amy? What color eyes do you notice the most when you go outside? When you see people behind masks? Honestly, um, I've not been going out very much, and when I have, huh. I've been trying to. I've been annoyed at the people who are completely incapable of follow the norms of social distancing so i'm just trying to like get what i need to get and get away mm. from everybody so i don't think i'm noticing anyone's eyes oh i know fair uh rough estimate of the number of friends you have have who have been laid off work uh amy uh I mean, somewhere between a half dozen and a dozen, it may be more, not everybody is, is as vocal um, mm -hmm. as others, but so at least that many. Chris? Yeah, I, I feel like there, there haven't been too many friends that have specifically, um, you know, told me about it, except actually my roommate. So, you know, that literally hits close to home. Next question is, are we going to see Corona babies, <laughs> Chris? <laughs> <laughs> Chris, yeah. That one. yeah. Uh, I mean, we're going to see Corona babies. We're going to see Corona di divorces. We're going to see all sorts <laughs> of things uh, that come out of this. I mean, the, the the stresses that people are under as a result of like, you know, having to help turn place with quote unquote loved ones who they're, you know, maybe you're starting to question like how deep is your love? Um, <laughs> I think is real. Amy, are we going to see Corona babies? Um, yeah, but I do kind of feel like we're going to see more Corona divorces than, than David, <laughs> perhaps, because that okay. intense 24 seven is not for everyone. Yeah. Okay. All right. How many tabs do you have open on your browser on an average, Amy? On an average, I'd say, um, at least a couple dozen, but I use, um, I use a, a, a browser add on that lets me have like 20 of them that I can sleep so if I would were to include those, it's at least like forty to sixty. All right, Chris. Is, that, how many is it the suspender? Do you use the suspender app? I use Sidewise. Same. Oh, Sidewise. Mm, I, I use see. suspender, okay. and I use the one that just kills it because I don't have the energy to kill it. <laughs> all, the <laughs> resolve, all the resolve to kill it, I just can't kill it. So yeah, okay. Yeah. Chris, tell us how many tabs do you have open. You know, it, it's very spiky. I sort of go through a process. Like I tend to prefer to have a pretty. I would say clean, like digital workspace. Um, but right now I feel like I've got like 20 and, um, you know, I, I think that that's, that's average. I like to keep it around like four or five. And then I have, um, what are called site specific browsers or so sort of, they take the, um, you know, little web apps out of the browser and put them into their own tabable, um, OS level app mm -hmm. just for convenience. And so, um, that adds another, you know, 10, 10 or so apps probably. Okay. Who's your favorite Tiger King character? <laughs> Carol Baskins. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna leave it at that. Let's go. Let's go to Amy. <laughs> Who's your favorite Tiger King character, Amy? Um, actually, I'm blanking on her name, but the um, uh, the person whose whose uh, hand was eaten. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, she was the but, best. No, but, yeah. yeah, yeah, they were. So, they were she was so solid. <laughs> yeah. She was the sanest. <laughs> uh, did Carol Baskins murder her husband, uh, Amy? Yeah. <laughs> Chris, hundred percent, and fed him to the tigers. <laughs> That's your favorite character. Uh, 
Hey there, right. cool cats and kittens. <laughs> <laughs> Name me one celebrity who has coronavirus, Amy. Marianne Faithful. Hmm, Chris. Tom Hanks. The most unmarketable skill you've picked up over the course of your life, Chris. Procrastination, for sure. Although although I'm learning more about it and there's more ways of forgiving myself for it, which is like sort of the emotional or like avoiding emotional pain or something. So, but yeah, I, you know, I, I learned about that when I was procrastinating on something I was supposed to do. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Amy, the most unmarketable skill you've picked up. An enormous depth of knowledge about uh, Battlestar Galactica. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. Uh, when was the last time you were outside, Amy? Um, actually, yesterday um, we sat out on our back deck for um, probably about an hour or so, which was really nice because it was a gorgeous day. All right, Chris. <laughs> um. Also yesterday, although um, probably outside, outside was um, on Saturday. So it was two days ago um, when I went on a nice long, you know, four and a half hike in the woods. Okay, so that's the end of the rapid fire round. Let's go on to the bigger questions. And the first question is, do you think it's true that the recession will wipe out smaller companies and leave bigger companies without much competition? Um. You know, I was actually talking about this with my husband the other day because he was we were talking about, you know, when we break uh, quarantine next week for another shopping run, um, where we're going to go and what outside food we're going to pick up. And, you know, I was saying that we really need to go to our, you know, our neighborhood pizzeria and, you know, the places like Sonic and McDonald's and all the chains and everything are going to exist after this. Um, but you know, our, our little neighborhood ones aren't, but then I was thinking about it and the, a lot of the chains, what we forget are actually owned by small businessmen, uh, or women, you know, they're small business people. They're, they're, uh, the franchisees and mm -hmm. whether or not they survive, um, is, is certainly a question. I think in the short term, um, a lot of small businesses are going to uh, collapse, but there's other smaller ones that are sort of springing up um, to meet the the differing needs now. Um, I'm a big history nerd, and uh, I've been thinking actually for the last probably 15 years or so about the beginning of uh, the last century and the beginning of this one, and when we were going to start seeing similar issues like the rise of the labor movement, which we've started to see, um, the, uh, the pushback against the large corporations, which we've been seeing, the, the fight for um, better working conditions. Uh, you know, 100 years ago, it was about uh, the work week and, and child labor, and now it's more about um, health care and and the, the the all the jobs that that you know cut, have your hours low enough so that you you don't qualify for benefits under or under them so it's sort of different things but it's very similar things and that caused a huge convulsion that that broke up a lot of monopolies and that rippled really throughout all of the the uh, the 20th century until sort of the last quarter of it as the the pendulum started swinging back and i i i just feel like with everything that's going on and with the pandemic happening at the same time as the economic convulsion that short term yes a lot of small businesses are going to collapse but long term the effects on the larger corporations and potential for them um not surviving long term um history says that you know that will happen i mean i'm not i'm not an historian but you know i follow i follow some on twitter and, and um they've been seeing a lot of of parallels to to the beginning of the 20th century uh, uh, the, yeah the beginning of the 20th century and and um i i just i feel like long term that the the big businesses are not going to fare as well as they are going to in the short term mm. Okay, Chris. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I mean, I certainly think that there's a lot of um, small businesses that are going to really struggle through this time. Um, and, 
the thing that really just concerns me the most is the kind of almost like, <clears throat> you know, you have like a tsunami wave and then you kind of have like the, the aftershocks or something. Um, I, for some reason, this comes to mind when a friend of mine was teaching me to surf, she sort of pointed out that usually there's like sort of like, like waves that come in threes and you want to kind of like wait for the third wave or something to actually like, you know, ride that one. Um, even if the first, you know, two might seem large. Um, and that's just like the pattern that they, um, follow. And in a similar way, I feel like there's kind of like the, the frontal wave that's coming through like right now when we can sort of see, um, the impact and we can see the unemployment claims and we can see, um, you know, the uh, immediate businesses that just, you know, either, you know, we're early in their journey, didn't have a lot of cash in the bank, or, um, you know, we're really like working on the margins and didn't say have a established community to support them, um, you know, in, in lean times and they get kind of like wiped out. And it's really like the, God, what do they call it? There's a certain type of wave that kind of the rogue wave, I think, um, mm -hmm. that kind of comes up afterwards. And that's the thing that actually does all the damage because it sits around and kind of like floods, you know, your community and you don't know when it's really, you know, when the waters are going to recede. And so I feel like in a similar way, um, there's going to be this like, you know, frontal assault essentially on our economy. And then there's the, the slow process of seeing a bunch of other things just like fail or just like not be there when you thought that they would be because you had no idea that actually they were struggling or something because they had no way of actually communicating it or that and sort of like, you know, treading water in, indefinitely um, until you just expire. And so I think that the the slow burn for some, some businesses is going to be like the real, the real hard part. Um, and we don't know again, all the interconnectedness, it, you know, it's interesting. Um, <laughs> I've also been watching a bunch of uh, nature documentaries and there's one that's really great on Netflix called night on earth. And there's this kind of observation that there are these, I think, I don't know if they're like bridge species or something, but they're sort of the in-betweens and whether they're little like, you know, bugs or rodents or something like that, they, you kind of don't think of that about them very much relative to let's say, you know, jungle cats, uh, you know, and I don't know, like, uh, amoebas or something. Um, but they actually keep the whole ecosystem, you know, working. And when you remove one of those species, it causes this, this horrible, um, situation. I think wolves might be one of them. Um, in any case, I kind of feel like there's a similar set of both service providers, um, small businesses, all the little, you know, kind of folks who fill in the cracks and make it all work. Um, and, and I imagine that those folks are going to really struggle, um, you know, in this, in this economy and it's going to have a huge, it's going to create a lot more burdens on businesses that, that used to, um, you know, live and breathe based on them. So yeah, uh, I definitely think it's going to happen. No, I completely agree with the rogue wave and the bridge species analogy. I think uh, that's why there is such an emphasis in several economies on the importance of small businesses. I think uh, the German economy is the prime example of this because it is almost wholly comprised and tilted in favor of small and medium sized businesses. And that's actually something that has made it resilient to past economic crises. But what I also wanted to say, keeping in mind uh, what Amy has said about the radical socioeconomic change in the US and the world economy that was already in progress for the past 15 years before coronavirus came along and that has been exacerbated with the arrival of coronavirus because because Amy says that uh, while small businesses might suffer in the short term, there are other small businesses that might arise to serve the new demand chains. And it's not necessary that large businesses won't suffer in the long term because of this. So, so one can also apply the metaphor of natural selection out here. Clearly, the virus has caused a disruption and the fittest or the most versatile are going to survive, whether they are small, medium or large businesses. And another thing to keep in mind is that, you know, coronavirus is obviously an exceptional circumstance, but we have seen continuously in the past, you know, some sort of a downturn that happens every 10 years. Like we had a crisis in 2009 and then before that and so on. So I think the small and medium-sized medium businesses need to keep in mind that they have a maximum of a 10-year window to get their resources in order just in case something happens and force is natural selection once again because i think this is it's worth on the one hand it is worth to look at history to sort of get some sense of how things have been dealt with before i mean uh, a lot of the things that we're, we're talking about now um as part of the recovery efforts whether it's uh, physical distancing or ha contact tracing you know has has actually those those ideas those behavioral technologies have been in place um for possibly like hundreds of years or at least 100 years or so and so like there's not a lot of newness in terms of how we're thinking about 
the response, but I think it would be a mistake for businesses to also not recognize that uh, the the nature of business and the nature of entrepreneurship, I think, has changed and evolved, um, or at least it's always been the same, but now it's a little bit different because the access to information is so much greater than it's been before. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm sure we'll talk about it, but there are a number of opportunities for businesses to actually, yeah, to, to use your, your natural selection uh, metaphor and to sort of expand it a bit. Um, you know, uh, natural selection takes place over successive generations over thousands or millions of years. Whereas in this case, you can literally like be on Twitter and like see some information mm-hmm. and be like, oh, right, actually, I can totally reform my business. And what I thought was my business and where I thought the value was actually isn't there anymore. And so I need to change. And rather than waiting for like, you know, 15 generations in the future to kind of have some something happen organically, you can actually, you know, bring that future into the present um, a lot more, I think, you know, easily if you're willing to like make the leap and take the jump. Um, and, you know, I can, I can talk about it, like an example that I had recently uh, about this, but I think that it's important to sort of draw the distinction that um, although there will be echoes of the past, um, you know, the, the, what do they say that like history doesn't repeat, but it does rhyme. Um, and I think it's very important to think about what's different in this moment um, to give people a chance um, to, uh, I hate to say it, but make the most of this circumstance. And I think the corollary to that, though, is that there's also far more access to misinformation. Um, oh, totally. And, mm-hmm. and, and not just about the pandemic, but even to your example, where a lot of people like something works for them and they forget that, you know, um, correlation is not causality mm-hmm. and, mm-hmm. Uh, and assume that that's the way it is. And I've seen so many people just over the last 10 years, like latch onto an idea of like, well, this is how you do things now. And it, it might be mm-hmm. for them, but mm-hmm. um, it, it very often isn't. <laughs> it's a fair point. Yeah, completely agree. So, so a couple of points that you guys have made is a natural selection, but also really rapid natural selection that's happening. Uh, and also it's well, sort of more of like, maybe it's like entrepreneurial selection. Yeah, yeah. And also it's a lot of times based on luck because as Amy is saying, there's information, but there's also misinformation. And what I'd also say is there's an information glut. There's too much information. Mm -hmm. So there's like, you know, all three of these going on, which is why I think it's kind of important to like, I was listening to uh, the co-founder of Weiss who has been on a podcast with uh, Edward Snowden. So what they're trying to say is that, oh, there's so many news outlets publishing news that's happening right now. So what we've we're not covering so much is opinions of philosophers or kind of celebrities of our age, like philosophers or historians or, you know, uh, entrepreneurs of our age on what they think of this whole crisis as a whole. So that's some kind of uh, misinformation. So not misinformation, but information that's kind of important. So I think they're coming out with a series, but they've only just uh, interviewed Edward Snowden. And he thinks there are going to be four waves of this virus, or like you were talking about the more dangerous wave that comes uh, after this, the economic dangerous wave. So Mm -hmm. stuff like that. So I'm like, it's to the ability to look at the bigger picture from all the misinformation and the information glut that's like around you. So let's try to move on to the next one, which is uh, what are some marketable skills one can work on during this time of social distancing in order to get ahead of the curve? Uh, So analytics, coding, anything you guys want to come up with? Chris, you can start on this one. Yeah, I think some of the skills that you might want to be thinking about during this time. um, I mean, for me, it, it does come down to a bit of self management, emotional intelligence, self-awareness, um, and uh, just sort of all in the theme of maybe self-management. Um, and I say that because we don't know exactly how work is going to change. Um, and, and if, you know, people listening to this are more or or are information workers, um, and I don't want to make that an assumption, but if I were to speak to information workers, obviously there's a shift towards, um, a lot more online work, a lot more digital work, a lot more work that doesn't necessarily have to be done in a, in a shared office space. And the dynamics of that are, are quite different, um, both, or maybe specifically from, from a personal management self-care perspective. Um, there's no one else to sort of, you know, check in on you per se, although maybe you can, you know, set up uh, social connections or whatever that do, um, kind of help you out with accountability. Um, and, and that kind of like, Hey, have you eaten today kind of thing? Or have you showered this week? Um, are you wearing pants? Like those types of things. Um, which hopefully you're still aware of. Um, but, you know, I think those are the types of skills uh, during this time that I think are worth looking into. Um, certainly, there's a lot of professional development uh, that you can do. You can, you know, learn some coding, learn learn analytics, you can learn some Python. You can, you know, I, I, I downloaded this new um, 
uh, coding framework to try out, even though I don't really code, um, with, with the thought that I'll learn it during this time. But I think it's really important to recognize this, again, can go on indefinitely um, for quite a while, and that the impact is going to be huge. And that um, if you're sort of again, like holding your breath kind of uh, emotionally or spiritually thinking that we're going to get out of this in a month or so um, and everything's going to go back to normal. I just think that's not necessarily realistic. Um, and even when we do start to, you know, return to uh, public spaces, the atmosphere is going to be different. We're going to feel different. We're going to feel stressed differently. We're going to interact with people differently. There might be, again, like some of that tension that I that I alluded to um, on my walk where, you know, you just don't know if, you know, folks have... Uh, you know, are are currently infected, like have been infected, are immune. Um, and that kind of, you know, paranoia, I think, does or will um, affect some people more than others. And so I think it's just really important to sort of like have that um, steady state within yourself. Um, and now is a great time to work on that. Mm -hmm. Amy? Um, I, you know, I think uh, if, you know, if you have the time and you're sort of in the mental place to do it, which if you're not, then absolutely what Chris is talking about, it's <laughs> no time like the present. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, the, it, there are so many um, free online webinars and, and free coding, um, you know, on, you know, Code for America. And, and uh, you know, there's, there's so many different opportunities that I, I feel like it, it's if it's something that's interested you and you find you do have the time to do it, um, then then you know then go for it. There, uh, it's it's all, I mean it's all there and it's all accessible. Um, so I you know I I think it's good for everybody to understand like the basics of coding. I don't I don't think everybody needs to know how to code, but I do think everybody should have a basic fluency in in coding so if and and it's something that's helped me a lot because i've been able to um uh, like i could build a website but it would take a really long time and it probably wouldn't look that great but i have the knowledge in html and css to be able to do that by myself if i had to um but i i've never had to um but what it's done is it's enabled me to work with designers and developers very easily um, to get what I need um, in the best designed way, um, or to get what a client needs in, in you know the way that works the best. Um, so you know, certainly, I think if you're in any, you know, and, and obviously, I, I feel like probably a lot of your audience um, are marketers or um, people who would be interested in going into into marketing, and I do feel like any marketer who has knowledge you know basic coding knowledge um particularly if you're talking about you know web development um it's it's extremely extremely useful um uh, but other other coding too like i i had uh um i've had engineers uh who do you know predictive analytics and stuff like that who saw that i i you know understood uh, SQL and 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 so the conversations I was able to have with them cha literally changed. I like saw the conversation like you could almost see visually the change in the conversation because it was sort of like oh this is someone who actually basically understands and then they were also very happy to explain things to me that I didn't because they felt like I I would get it um, so. You know, like I said, while I don't think that, you know, everybody needs to learn to code, I do think it's extremely valuable to have the, you know, have some basic understanding so you can have that conversation. The same with analytics, uh, particularly if you're in marketing, uh, to have a basic understanding of analytics is hugely valuable because then you can sort of bumble into the analytics programs and, and find your way around and you actually start learning it. I've, I've taught myself, you know, lots of different analytics programs and, and, and HTML and CSS. And it's, it's, I've enjoyed it. And I've learned a lot more from people who knew a lot more because they saw that I, I actually wanted to learn and that I had by myself. Yeah, while we all agree that in our fields, coding is probably very helpful, it is also not like a complete necessity. Like personally, I'm terrible at coding and I figured out 
I mean, I figured that out when I took coding in high school and it really brought my grades down. And since then, I've mostly been like, I'm not going to do this again. But that doesn't mean that I lack the creativity that a coder somehow has, which is why I use a variety of no code tools and work for a no code tool company myself, Artgrow.co, that allows you to design applets, widgets and interactive content without using any developers. And I think what both of you have been saying is that during this time of the coronavirus crisis, It's how adaptable someone is and how creative they can get with what they already know without, you know, taking too much pressure on themselves Uh, that might help them judge what they should be learning in this quarantine and social social distancing time. So so at this point, I want to tell our audience that uh, we actually have a link on this podcast landing page where you can search over 101 free online Ivy League courses from Harvard, Yale, etc. in humanities, you know, marketing, business analytics, even coding, science and health, uh, do feel free to check them out. And also another thing to keep in mind is all the information about what's happening to the society around you. So for this, I usually come up with an example of what I've personally done in this time, you know, with the ban on public gatherings, most restaurants around the world have been forced to turn into takeaway and delivery spots. And not all of them want to use Uber Eats or Yelp as delivery services. And so I managed to design a simple build your own burger interactive menu like the one you see in McDonald's where you pick your bun type, meat type, you know, vegetable, etc. And get a customized pricing option so that these restaurants in my neighborhood could put them up on their website and collect orders and make automated deliveries. And all of this is just totally possible through no code tools. Uh, But speaking of this whole obsession with code coders and coding in general, uh, as some sort of a universal hack to the economy we are living in, uh, what do you all think about the virus, the coronavirus itself, uh, operating like a code the way it's ruined the whole supply chain economy that's, uh, you know, very code based. So that's what uh, because that's what a virus is right a creature on the edge of life that is just meant to replicate a particular function again and again and again without any any sentience or conscious decision i i I guess i'll just jump in there like i mean yeah i mean the the uh the coronavirus itself is essentially a type of algorithm that you know binds to our existing biology and exploits um the way in which our body you know replicates and, and does all things that it does um and uh, however one thing i guess on the one hand what i like about your uh, metaphor there is that code itself isn't self-aware you know you can like run yeah. code and it'll do things but it doesn't have any volition unto itself and i was listening to another podcast recently and um it was it was very strange because um the the, the speaker whose name is uh, scott galloway um i think this was the the pivot podcast um was sort of talking about how uh like the virus wants to sow discontent amongst us and wants to separate us and you know that's the enemy and the enemy you know wants us to be you know disconnected from each other or something and so we can't coordinate or whatever and right now we need to like come together and i'm like i don't i don't think the virus cares like you know it's sort of like this uh errant thing that exists in the environment that happens to like, you know, find, I, and I don't, it's, it's, it's weird, right? Because it, it, I guess this is your point about not listening to enough philosophers. It's like, what is the point of a virus? Why does a virus exist in the environment? How does that actually come to be? Um, and it is sort of just like a piece of code that like sort of, you know, copies itself and then replicates itself and then wants to, it doesn't want anything. I, I keep, you know, I, I anthropomorphize it myself. Um, but yeah, I mean, in, in a way, I suppose maybe like having a more useful analogy, like what is this? It's it's it's, it's sort of like, um, you know, when like I, I feel like it's like Outlook people send you emails, and there's this like S mime file that's like always attached, and it doesn't do anything as far as you can tell. It's sort of like you know this innocuous piece of text that like gunks up your mail. I, don't know, I feel like it's a little bit like that. Like it just kind of like floats around and like lands on humans, and humans happen to be susceptible to it. And it's not like the virus like designed itself or cares. Right. It just Mm kind of happened that way. So, yeah, it's sort of like a weird errant file that just kind of copies itself. It's, you know, and and there's a reason why we call those things viruses or malware in the computing sense. Right. I mean, the analogy came from biology first. Mm. Yeah. And actually, to to that point, even a computer virus doesn't it's it's just doing what it was designed to do. It's Mm. not it's not it may be let loose 
in a certain company's computers by a human on purpose to do something to them, but it's still only doing what it was designed to do. And that's what, you know, I mean, that's, Mm -hmm. I I, I think that's actually a really good analogy of it being, uh, and I think until we start thinking of it properly. That's why I hate all these like analogies, like these war analogies, like we're mm-hmm. at war with the coronavirus. The coronavirus. <laughs> it's, it's, but it's not, it's not at war with us. No, it's like... not. <laughs> it's, we're not, we're, we're, we're trying to find it and, and, and stop it. And if we stop at one place, it's just going to continue in other places. It's like, it just, and it's not because it's smarter than us, and it's not because it, you know, studied Napoleon pre-Waterloo. It's it's uh, it's just it's doing, you know, like Chris said, just it's replicating because that's what it does. It's and not a sentient being, in short. No. It's not like yeah, it's not. It's there's a very famous uh, quote that comes to mind, and it, it's very relevant because assuming the United States is or was the superpower until now uh moby dick captain ahab is full against the whale but that's what tabak has made tries to tell him but it's not a sentient being it didn't actually bite off your uh Mm. because i think he's missing a leg or a hand because it intended to it just did it because that's what it does it wasn't trying to be vengeful towards you it's not that the virus is you know being like oh i'm gonna like get people no it's it's a creature on the edge of life it's just a code that's just doing what it's just meant to do so it's a very bizarre situation (laughs) no but what it what it's doing in terms of the economy is it's actually it has shown us by accident i mean it it didn't mean to a byproduct Mm. of it is that it's shown us a lot of weaknesses in our economy in how we how we function as a society um and it would be to our benefit to pay attention to that and stop thinking about it as as a war, but rather thinking about how can we change things so the next time one of these comes along, because it will, because that's what viruses do. Um, the next time there's a pandemic that it doesn't have this, you know, crushing effect on our economy. I mean. Uh, Kevin Cruz, who's this one historian who I do follow on Twitter, someone asked him for his opinion about, you know, historically what this is like. And he said, well, we've never actually been through a time like this in history because you had like 10 years between the influenza uh, pandemic in, you know, that started in 1918 and the stock market crash, which didn't immediately result in the depression. It, 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 took a few years before it really took hold and he called this like disaster voltron because it's just we've piled multiple disasters on top of each other and but the the virus the virus doesn't care it's not like it was like oh i can crash the economy that would be great yeah yeah the the virus has no concept of what an economy is no (laughs) In short, the bigger question is, what does it have to say about the economy that a, that an insentient code managed to crack it? And which is why, as a marketer or a data analyst, you one should be, if one has to train oneself in anything, is to actually use this entire situation that's happened because of the coronavirus to actually educate oneself about this happened. What was wrong with the economy? You know, look at the bigger pattern, I guess, one of the things one could do. Uh, let's try to see the next question, which is... Well, uh, actually, I mean, on that point, because I think I think yeah. this is a very like interesting question to ask, um, because at, at the very least, you can look at the last several years of I would say, you know, criticism and critique, um, especially, you know, given candidates like Andrew Yang and Bernie Sanders in, you know, the U.S., um, talking about these income disparities and talking about the need to, you know, pull more economic resources, uh, namely money, um, from, you know, the the economic 1% um, and to redistribute it to the economy. And you do have to kind of, like, ask this question, and I think it, it has been asked, um, but with some... I'm not exactly like sure the right lens for this, but there are lots of you know millionaires and billionaires who are starting to use their vast resources to try to um, you know confront this this issue. And rather than and and we're sort of finding at least in the United States um, that a decentralized, uncoordinated effort actually is kind of problematic, given the 
um, the way that the supply chain operates. The supply chain is like much leaner than I think you know we could ever really imagine or fathom. Um, and so when there are stresses put on it, for example, toilet paper, you start to see how that system um, isn't necessarily designed for a certain kind of resiliency um, or or shocks to demand. Um, you know, I think toilet paper is like just this amazing example. Whereas, you know, we at least had seen, let's say, fuel shortages, um, you know, in the '80s. Um, when basically the cartels were like, well, we're just not going to like, you know, give you any more oil. And then suddenly the U S is, you know, has been on a path to, um, energy independence, like as a result of that. And, you know, I don't know if we're going to get into a place where each of us produces our own toilet paper. So we have toilet (laughs) paper independence, but like the lessons from the last, um, sort of issue or, or, uh, like experience like this, you know, resonates over time. And so had, let's say Andrew Yang been president or had Bernie Sanders been president during this time and had enacted a bunch of those policies, which he'd been arguing for, how would this situation be different? Would we be in a better place? Would the federal government be able to do this like ridiculous kind of, you know, bailout, which, you know, may not be sufficient. Um, and also what are, what lessons and mechanisms and, um, fixes are we applying based on the lessons from the 1918 Spanish flu influ- influenza, or I think there was another one in the 50s or something. Um, and how have we actually mitigated some of these challenges? Because we have information technology from these tech giants, which manipulated us into using all of our attention and abusing us, et cetera. And yet are the places in which we're able to find, granted, there's lots of disinformation and misinformation, um, useful information from reputable sources um, that allow us to actually change our behavior much more quickly than, let's say, it would have happened in the the turn of the century. I completely agree. And I was, I was just saying uh, the other day, uh, the fact that Andrew Yang and everyone were talking about the universal basic income, which no mm-hmm. one really agreed with and thought was completely stupid, is now actually happening. Well, in, in Spain, for instance, they've introduced it and they expect it to continue after the virus as well. So they actually uh, yep. made it a law that has no end at present and they, they've done it consciously saying that we actually want to have a universal basic income and i would never have imagined it as something that would be possible i mean i've, I've heard finland was experimenting with it and andrew yang is the only one who was talking about it in the uh yeah, democratic right. primaries so so i also look at these like, if you were to look at like from a very broad historical perspective maybe the presence of candidates like andrew yang actually heralded the fact that you know something like this was bound to happen, which they probably saw that they might, we should have universal basic income before something happens that forces us to have universal basic income. And I think uh, that's how we're progressing historically. But isn't it always the case? I mean, I feel like that's, that's the thing, right? You sort of stay in your steady state situation, you know, where you're, you know, moderating and modulating, um, you know, deviations from whatever your norm is, from whatever your steady state is, until you have a shock to the system. And you realize that the way you were doing things actually won't prevent um, the kind of, you know, pain or loss that we're experiencing now. And so what are we going to do? We're going to like change a bunch of things to shore up against this. And I guess I find what's so interesting is the kind of residue of memory like f- does fade um somewhat you know quickly i mean after the ebola crisis um with george w bush there was a bunch of uh pandemic readiness that was prepared i think maybe that was when they really um focused on uh physical distancing as a technique to slow the the spread of these you know viruses um so it's not like we haven't seen this even somewhat recently it's that a lot of the funding that was going to those things goes away after the immediate sort of, you know, pain or burn or rash or whatever you want to call it, um, uh, you know, that's on society kind of goes away, right? Well, like you stop- I mean, in, this, in this case, Trump just disbanded the office. Well, exactly. <laughs> well, this, that, that is exactly to my point, right? Yeah. Where like the pain of the Ebola crisis was so far in the rearview mirror that it was just like, oh, you know, it's not that bad. Like, we'll be fine. And then you realize, oh, wow, like actually when it happens, a spike like this is something we are not prepared for because of the resources and attention that it requires. And so you do have to have kind of, you know, elder statespersons kind of reminding you, like, by the way, like we are not prepared and it's going to go really poorly. And it's interesting to have Fauci in the position that he's in because he was the guy um, that I I guess has been in that position um, with the CDC through not only a number of administrations, but through the AIDS crisis, through Ebola. And so he's seen this stuff before. And, um, yeah, I mean, it's it's such an interesting contrast to hear, you know, a politician that's, you know, been in place for, you know, three years uh, with someone who's really, you know, dedicated their life to these types of problems. And, um, you know, he looks at it very matter-of-factly and like, we've been here before and we are not prepared. And so therefore, these are the options that we have. 
It's, uh, I was actually looking at Statista. They had this uh, list of countries most prepared for an epidemic. Now, this this st- statistic, which is actually true, had been like it surfaced in October when this started to happen, or I think mm-hmm. November, December. This was for the past five years. They were just looking at developed nations that were most prepared, and the U.S. was actually pretty much on the top. And now, like even even the information that Statista had based on what steps had been taken to prepare a country for an epidemic. All of that has been like completely overturned now. Now that we are actually facing it, and and none of that actually matters because all these countries and a uh, huge amount of trouble. So uh, that's just something that came to my mind regarding uh, the U.S.'s preparedness for an epidemic, despite and, and the amnesia uh, around uh, uh, epidemics of the past, for instance, the Ebola one, and how easy it is because of the information glut to actually uh, forget important things. Well, uh, I think yeah. I think also that what we forget is that we the virus may may not be um sentient but um we are and um human beings are subject to whims and something like this the preparedness of an entire nation can be um subject literally to the whim of one person (laughs) and all of that preparedness thrown away Completely. I love how we're not named that person, but we all know it is. <laughs> I believe it's subject number one. Yes. Oh, individual number one, sorry. Individual. And his news network. Wait, who said that? I didn't say that. <laughs> anyway, uh, all right. So you've, uh, the next question is, you've both been in managerial roles at several companies. Uh, what skills, professional or personal, do you think will you or managers in general be looking out for after the epidemic? Uh, we can start with Amy this time. Sure. Um, I I think it's kind of hard to say because it's also what, uh, I guess there's two ways of looking at the question. One is um, what, what will this uh, pandemic cause me to look for as qualities in, in an employee versus what things will people have learned from it that will make them more valuable employees? Um, I th- I think both of them in the end come down to um, a versatility and uh, and a natural curiosity and the ability to. I mean, that's really what versatility is, is the the ability to adapt to changing conditions. Uh, I don't know that that's really any different than than I ever did. I like to hear about um, how people have sort of faced a challenge and 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 how they how they adapted to it. You know, when you go into it, I mean, no job you ever go into ends up being. exactly what you know the no job is ever exactly what the job description is but sometimes it's it's less so than others particularly in startups where things evolve so much um so really for me it's it's the ability to um even if you're thrown by the direction something is going to uh like then just pick yourself up and be like okay now what do we have like what do we have to do which is a very abstract skill and you sort of have to get at it by asking you know asking a lot of questions um but i i think really that that's just something that that serves people well no matter what uh chris yeah it seems that um a lot of the skills that you're going to need, like, you know, in any kind of job, um, are, are just somewhat more, you know, amplified in this moment. And I, I agree with a lot of what Amy said. And I think I would perhaps add to that the, the need for, for self-management and communication, um, as being like two really core, um, you know, skills or, or areas of development that are going to come into, um, you know, really their own importance in this moment. Um, obviously I, I mentioned about self-management and just self-awareness, you know, what are your needs? What are you doing for self-care? Um, are you going out and getting, you know, a walk in, um, on a regular basis? Are you eating well, sleeping enough? Um, you know, are you able to t- t- turn off the news and, you know, the constant stream of updates, um, 
you know, what are you doing to sort of just, you know, maintain your, your emotional and mental fitness. Um, and then the other piece of that is about communication. So once you have that awareness, how do you communicate with others uh, about what you need or about your progress or your, um, your work or, you know, with things that are coming up, um, because especially if more of us are, are working from home and are working remotely and we're having to coordinate and, you know, deal with schedules and things like that, um, it, it's very important for us to be able to communicate um, what our needs are and what our boundaries are. And um, for, for folks who either, you know, struggle with conflict or require kind of face-to-face interactions, this really, you know, puts your ability to communicate clearly, succinctly, um, and without any passive aggressiveness um, or sort of obliqueness, in other words, being... Um, indefinite or unclear about what it is that you're trying to say, you know, for example, like I really can't meet you, you know, today because I'm just like feeling super stressed out and the kids are going crazy and I haven't eaten in three days and I'm waiting for delivery and, you know, all this stuff to be able to sort of, you know, push back on certain things and to make sure that you, you are resourced, um, when you're working with other folks. So I think it's, it's those things. And, and in some ways, I guess, you know, uh, like we were talking about whenever this, you know, return to, or I guess I don't even like this idea of like a return to uh, a normal. It's almost like coming back from vacation and like picking up from where you left off. I feel like it's more like, how are you going to integrate this new reality um, as mm-hmm. parts of it become or return to something that seems familiar, but yet is completely different? Um, how will you show that re- resilience over time? And can you think of a time during this pandemic when you really struggled and what was your response and what did you learn about yourself? And how did you incorporate um, the lessons from that learning into how you, you know, act now? Um, that would be something that I'd be interested to, to learn about. No, true, because uh, it's, it's interesting how both of you have actually uh, picked out personal development as the key thing. Uh, because uh, at our company, we'd made a widget that helps people just look for courses online during this epidemic. It's just called 101 free online Ivy League courses that, for your coronavirus isolation. Hmm. And in that, one of them just happens to be uh, Yale's Science of Wellbeing. And there were a lot of clicks on that course. And uh, <laughs> we went and read online and it has had 1.2 million signups since the uh, coronavirus crisis began. So I think... Hmm. The emphasis has been kind of on personal development, I'd say. And I I imagine, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, it's also an extremely stressful time in a way that, that I don't, that I I don't really know too many people alive now have, have undergone. I mean, I think certainly people who, who lived through the civil rights movement had, you know, extreme stresses but i think for like people who are in the workforce now for the most part um this is a wholly unique this is different than and i'm i'm a new yorker a native new yorker my parents are native well my mom's a native new yorker my dad moved here when he was 13 you know september 11th was a huge stressful thing you know everybody i know knew people who died um i included i as did i but this is um, it's, it's, I, I hate to repeat it, but it, it really is disaster Voltron. This is like multiple things happening, multiple things. Any of them would be huge stresses in and of themselves. And then, uh, and, and there's so much uncertainty around both the illness and it's, it's long-term effects on us and the economy and it's long-term effects on us that, that it it sort of makes sense that those are things that people are reaching for because they've never had to deal with this many different types of stresses with so much uncertainty, so much uncertainty on top of it. Um, and then you had many people who were already under extreme press, pressure economically because the way the gig economy has evolved over the last 10 years has really, really changed uh, the workforce and made a lot more people um, with, like a a lot fewer people have benefits that changed somewhat with the ACA. But, you know, there there have been a lot of changes over the last 20 years and, and that a lot of people were already feeling a lot of economic stress and a lot of health stress because of the healthcare situation. And then this on top of it, it's it's really the the stresses that people are under right now. Um, it's really unprecedented, and the fact that people are reaching out to 
find any way to deal with that is not at all surprising. Mm. Chris, you were saying something as well? No, I don't have anything to add. Okay. Uh, <laughs> all right. So uh, I was going to say uh, the next one is, okay, well, there has been a lot of stress, but there are also a lot of people out of jobs. So the next question is, uh, uh, what are some of the ways in which people can make money online during this time if they've been laid off, affiliate programs, freelance work, websites, etc.? Chris, you can begin if you like. Yeah, you know, um, it's, it's really interesting. Um, and I, I don't know exactly how this trend is going to go um, because on the one hand, suddenly lots of folks are offering, you know, courses, um, you know, and other kinds of, you know, digital downloadables, little eBooks, you know, things like that. And they're charging for them. And I've noticed in general, it seems as though there's a lot more content online that has, you know, sort of a paywall or some other, um, you know, price attached to it. And, I just feel like the internet has gotten a lot more expensive <laughs> lately. Um, you know, uh, everything sort of has a subscription in front of it. Um, and, and payment through, you know, the digital layer now is a lot more commonplace. And so um, on the one hand, there's lots of things that you can charge for. I think the question then is how do you go about um, actually finding customers and selling um, what you're doing? And I guess for, for me personally, it's, it's, it's an interesting moment too, because um, the, the travels that I'd mentioned were to go speak in other places and I would get paid to speak. And that was kind of like how I was making money for a little while. Um, in addition to product design and consulting. And more recently I've started to offer half hour consulting calls using a new platform called super peer. And it's really great for me because on the one hand, like it's very sort of like fast and quick. Um, you know, I can make a little money off of it and, um, I think people get some good value out of it. So there are those little more, uh, kind of, I don't know if I want, want to call it like piecemeal opportunities, but these uh, platforms and tools that offer you to schedule your time, charge money for it. Um, it takes care of uh, like, you know, the scheduling process, the billing, um, and usually they take a cut. So there's lots of opportunities there, I guess, um, whether that's just selling your time, your attention, your skill, um, teaching other people. And then it's a matter of figuring out how to get that in front of people. Um, that I think is, is, is the challenge. But there's a lot of directories that I've seen. Um, I'm a very active uh, member of a community called Product Hunt. And there's been a number of different services and tools that have come up that are like, you know, hey, like, you know, here's some, if not volunteer opportunities, places where you can, um, you know, pitch in or create content and then um, quickly monetize it. So I don't know, lots of stuff is out there. Similar to, you know, how it was before, but um, now, of course, if you are not working, you know, full-time or commuting, you can use that time to um, take your knowledge of Battlestar Galactica, for example, and uh, publish <laughs> oh, yeah, premium come content. Come in handy someday. <laughs> <laughs> Now's your moment. <laughs> so, yeah. All right, Amy. Um, I, you know, the, the interesting thing about that, and I think that that's a, a you know, those sorts of platforms are very valuable. And I agree, I, I feel like in certain ways the internet is is becoming more expensive um, in, in those ways. But um, part of the problem there is that if you haven't been, if you haven't already built a, um, a following um, in whatever it is or built a reputation, whether it's in freelance writing or in design or, or something like that, it's, um, it's harder to to find it now, especially because a lot of other people who might have been your customers in the past um, no longer uh, have jobs, or they've had to tighten their belt because their business, you know, is making a lot less money and they've laid off their staff. Um, I think it's uh, I, I think it's going to be interesting um, when we come out of this to see how the uh, platforms like um, TopTal and, and Fiverr uh, and others have fared, um, like how much their, their ranks have increased. I'd love to know like how many more applications uh, for being, you know, on the platform TopTal has gotten because they, you know, really put you through major, major tests to make sure your skills are really, you know, that you are the top talent. Um, so I think that will be very interesting. I think it's it's just um, in terms of if you've been laid off and, and you're going online for work, I think finding those platforms like what Chris is talking about um, are 
going to be a better route just because they're they're drawing in audience for you. Um, but I, I don't know if the customer base uh, for a lot of people is necessarily there. And if everybody who's been laid off starts doing it, it then it then does it then does to other things what uh, the glut of of writers online did for freelance writing um, and which made it so that you used to be able to make a good living as a freelance writer. And now, unless you have a very specialized knowledge on, on certain topics, um, it's a lot harder to because no one's paying um, good rates for freelance writing. Um, so if the same thing happens in, whether it's in UX or in, in, in design or, you know, web, web development, just because it, it, you know, was writing that it happened in before doesn't mean that it couldn't in these others if a lot of people find themselves out of work and then you start finding people underbidding each other and in the end, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. I wish I knew because... Mm. Yeah, I mean, strangely enough, right, like <laughs> the, 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 the market dynamics are such that there's going to be a flood of folks, you know, on these platforms. Um, and I mean, one of the other things that I've seen on Product Hunt is not just like the opportunities, but actually lists of people who have been laid off by, you know, tech companies who are now suddenly available. So you have, um, you know, a pretty skilled labor pool um, joining into the overall labor pool, which previously, at least, you know, the unemployment rate was relatively low. Um, and that's going to really change, I guess, you know, what people are going to get paid. So, um, to look at this another way, maybe right now is actually a really good time to start a company or start a business because hiring, you know, talent is actually going to be a lot more accessible. Now, of course, that requires that you have the capital to do so, and you have an idea and and something to um, to put out there and offer, and it might be you know some lean months, but. Um, you're not going to have to necessarily pay the same rate that you used to have to pay to get, you know, like a programmer, a programmer or a designer or any of those folks, because suddenly, I mean, for what it is like, they're, they're out of work and they're going to be looking for opportunities. Um, mm -hmm. So, so there is that, that, that option as well, if you're willing to take that, that bet. Yeah. And I was also thinking that because there is an information glut out there, there is simply too much information. Uh, one of the ways that one can make money right now is by making simple no code information sifting tools for the affiliate programs of companies like Amazon, HubSpot, eBay, and Shopify. So, so what happens is that in an affiliate program, for those of you who, those of you who don't know, uh, you get a commission every time you direct someone to Amazon's website and that person purchases something. So, so it doesn't even have to be the product you directed them to. They could have just ended up on Amazon through your link and then whatever they end up buying, you get a cut of it. And from my experience, I've usually seen a lot of blog and vloggers and Instagram micro influencers using e-commerce quizzes and recommendations to direct their traffic to these links and then they end up making uh, some money out of that. So, so you know, if you have if you, so for instance, like if you were a cooking blogger, uh, you could make a simple recommendation that suggests items one can buy to maximize cooking efficiency or, you know, items you need to buy for a particular meal. And then in the outcomes of this simple quiz, you can just... Uh, put your affiliate link and direct people to eBay or Amazon or somewhere. So what I'll do is I'll put a link uh, on this podcast's uh, website uh, to a list of the highest paying online affiliate program. So you guys can actually just go and check it out there. Okay, so the next question is an audience question. Uh, there are many online courses for acquiring skills. Should one aim for those that provide certifications or not? You know, I don't know. I think it sort of depends what that certification is and who the cer certification is from. Um, I, you know, the, a lot of people sort of like create these like social media certification. I don't know what that, you know, uh, <laughs> I don't know what that means. How do you certify? It's like, I know what Twitter and Instagram are and I've used Snapchat. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know what that means. I think that there are certain certifications mm -hmm. that have technical or not even not, they don't have to be technical requirements, but specific requirements that it says that the person who has this certificate knows these six things, um, you know, or whatever it is. Um, I just think you have to be really careful. Um, I, I do think that a lot of employers traditionally have sort of been, um, they like, they like seeing that they, they don't really know what it means, uh, but they like seeing it. Mm -hmm. But I, 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 
I just feel like um, if you're going to actually spend money on something like that, make sure not only that it's something that the certification is going to mean something, but that um, that you actually learn something from it. Chris. Yeah, I mean, I, I honestly don't know because I never had to look into it. Um, but if I were to advise someone who was considering it, you know, one simple solution might be to think about the types of places that you would like to work. Um, if you have a list, um, and to actually reach out to their, you know, recruiters and to ask them, you know, <laughs> would this be relevant or worthwhile, or can you, um, you know, suggest a program that would be relevant to you that you look at? Um, because it, it sort of doesn't make sense to sort of make an assumption that just because you're, you know, pursuing, um, some sort of, you know, course that offers, um, a certificate that afterwards it's going to actually mean anything to anybody. Um, I know a lot of companies in Silicon Valley um, would ignore uh, any type of certificate and would be a lot more interested in, in looking at your GitHub repository um, or your contributions to some open source project as a way of of actually validating that you know what you know, um, because that's you know real world stuff and you've actually had to you know work with other people, let's say socially, um, on some coding or development pro uh, project. And that's going to say a lot more about your ability to jump into a new team and start making contributions right away. than um, if, for example, you learned something through a coding bootcamp, came out the other end and actually have no idea how to, you know, contribute to um, a team's repository and how to like check out other people's code and, um, you know, make commits and stuff like that. So, you know, I think it's, it's about demonstrating your knowledge of, um, you know, both the tools and um, any any type of technical information that you need to operate those those tools effectively, but then also how you use those tools in a social context, um, working with others. Um, so I think that's that's a way to think about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So the last question is: Why do you think there is a perceived need to pick up a skill during the pandemic, uh, during this human crisis, and what does it say about our age, Amy? Um. <laughs> you and I have talked about this, and um, I have very um, strong feelings. There was this this meme going around, and I was like, "If you don't use this time to, you know, start your side hustle, learn a new skill, blah blah blah, then it um, it was never about not having the time. It was about lacking the discipline or something like that." And I saw that, and I actually got really pissed off because, like I was saying earlier, this is a time of like really huge crisis. People are under enormous stress. First of all, people who are still working, it's not like they have this copious free time. I mean, maybe they, you know, were commuting an hour each way uh, to work. So they have that extra time. Um, but they, first of all, they don't have all this extra free time. Um, second, the people who have been laid off have enormous stresses. They're trying to figure out how they're going to pay their bills, how they're going to do all these things. Um, there's a huge disconnect between sort of like the, the hustle lifestyle. And I've hated like side hustle. I hate the word hustle because to me, hustle means two things. It either means a disco dance from the seventies or it means <laughs> you're trying to con people. <laughs> like that's what hustle has always meant to me. And I, I, I know that's not what people mean when they say it now, but it's still, I feel like the idea of, of having this, um, this, this worshiping at the altar of, of the side hustle has made people think that they need to be busy all of the time and that they can't have time to just sit there and relax or, or just try to, feel a little less stressed people who are actually having to go outside of their houses to go to work the stress that they must be feeling every day is a, I, I can't even imagine you have all these these people who work in the supermarket and people are like oh they're heroes and it's like they're not they're they're making like minimum wage or maybe you know a little more than minimum wage and they have to work because otherwise they're not going to be able to pay their bills and that's not that's not heroism. I'm not saying I'm not I'm not saying that in a negative way at all. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying that it's it's ignoring like it's ignoring reality to say that um, they they're working in the supermarket because that's how they pay their bills. They didn't like grow up saying my goal in, in life is to be a cashier. And I'm I'm 
I want to make it clear that I'm literally not saying there's anything negative about that, but I'm just saying that we've, we've come to believe that like everybody who wants to achieve something has, um, has the ability to, and, and it's, it's just not true. And we need to give people time to actually mentally heal. I have, I have two children, one of whom spent his 16th birthday yesterday, you know, just, Hey, we, we let him have the, have the TV all day for video games and we mm. watch the world with him and stuff. And, and my younger son misses his friends in school. You know, it's, it's, uh, there, there's, there are going to be psychological effects on us and on our children that we won't even know for, for years. And the idea that you have to pick up a new skill, um, when literally the world is in crisis, both in terms of a medical crisis and in terms of a financial crisis, either of which at any given time would be stressful. And, you know, I mean, I know I, I've beat this drum a few times here, but, you know, you got to cut people a break. You got to let them just like sit back and relax. And if they have those two extra hours of free time, let them just sit there and watch TV or spend time with their family or read a book or play a video game or sleep. <laughs> um, there's no, there is no need to learn a new skill. Um, if you want to, and if you feel like you, that's what's going to be healthy for you mentally, knock yourself out, like learn all the skills, you know, you desire. And that's great. And, you know, everybody processes these things differently. Um, and some people need to do that. Some people need to keep busy like that to, uh, to, mm. to do well, but not everybody does. And to regard those who, who need to step back and not, you know, hustle, um, as, as somehow wanting less or deserving less, I, I think has been a very detrimental aspect of the society we've been living in for most of my life <laughs> hmm. oh definitely yeah like what if there is nothing at the end of this epidemic so would you have rather spent your time just picking up a skill all this time when there was actually nothing like what if what if it mm. never ends <laughs> so you didn't actually live life you were just preparing for the life that was going to come and it never came but uh yeah chris how about you what do you think yeah you know i think um the the whole hustle porn thing is real. Um, there's an industry, I think, behind it that likes to sell you, you know, the equivalent of muscle milk or whatever it might be, um, you know, to sort of keep you going. Um, and one of the, I, again, I'm just going to keep harping on this because I think it's so important. One of the the sets of new skills that you could really focus on and learn during this time is self awareness, is you know, self care, is emotional fitness, is you know, understanding um, and developing more emotional intelligence. I just think that you know, everything that Amy said is right. Like people are living through a new set of stresses, uh, a new environment. Uh, and those things are real and your ability to adapt to them and to respond to them and to take care of yourself, um, I think benefits everyone around you. And so if you don't already have those skills, those are the first skills to I think to pick up. And then once you're in a place where you are resourced and you're able to take care of yourself and you're able to take care of the people around you who are expecting or are needing support from you, um, maybe because they don't have the same awareness um, or opportunity to um, develop that self-awareness, then you can, you know, contribute to, to their own, um, you know, well-being too. And so then once you've got that sort of like, you know, mesh of support figured out, then I think you can start to think about, okay, how do I improve my mental acuity or how do I develop some new skills or how do I pick up, um, you know, whether it's a new programming language or a new, um, you know, app or framework, or, you know, really get into the nitty gritty of, of how to develop no code, no code style, um, you know, products and applications. Um, all of that stuff I think is there waiting for you, but I think it requires first to really take that time to settle into this new, um, you know, situation. I, I it, it just feels like in, in one of the things that I've heard from, um, I would say like the, the professionals and like the medical, um, you know, in, in, uh, business or, um, area, um, as well as just other, I think, uh, you know, more sage, like political leaders, you know, is the notion that if you over prepare during this time, or if you over respond, um, and it turns out, you know, that, uh, let's say the, the, the curve bends in the right direction and, and, and so on. Um, 
you know, it's very hard to really, I think, relate to kind of a, like the negative space of, of success, you know, like if we flatten the curve and, and things aren't horrible and, you know, we don't have like a million people dead, um, it's hard to sort of con- congratulate us um, because obviously there are still people who, who died, but, but probably less than what would have been the alternative. So I feel like in a similar way, an overreaction in your personal life um, to really take care of yourself emotionally and to find that, that routine of self-care um, will pay off um, in lots of very subtle ways um, that you just can't measure if you didn't do that work, right? Like maybe you would have had a mental breakdown. Maybe you would have gone through a divorce. Maybe, you know, your kids would, you know, you know be destroying your house. I, I don't know. There's lots of negative adverse outcomes that could result if you don't actually take advantage to develop those, those skills. So I guess I just come back to that again. And I just think it's such a, a rare opportunity in human experience to have a justification, like a reason to be able to take that time for yourself um, in a way that otherwise might seem self-indulgent. But I think in this moment is entirely uh, relevant, worthwhile, and um, should be pursued. No, I completely agree, which is what the other day I was saying, maybe every two years we should have one month of quarantine so that people can actually <laughs> take a step back from the rat race and actually contemplate. Uh, well, I mean, if we just, you know, rewrote holidays uh, to be more about like self-care days and it was okay, you know, to sort of, you know, just not have to worry about commercialism and like buying things for people and, you know, having more uh, holiday lights than your neighbors or something like that, you know, we sort of make a, com- a competition out of everything. And I guess if we were to compete at who has the best self-care and the best emotional fitness, you know, maybe those are the type of Olympics that we should actually be engaging in at this point. <laughs> All right. So that's the end of the episode. Thanks for joining us, Amy and Chris, and see you guys again soon.